5,500 years ago, the area of present-day Poland. Huge stone boulders arranged in the shape of a triangle covered with a mound were the burial place for one of the most significant people of that distant period of over 5,500 years ago. Who was he to receive a tribute in the form of a 150 metre tomb which till this day has remained intact? A tribal leader? A shaman? How much did he mean to the people who, limited to the use of primitive tools and collective effort, built this huge grave long before the Egyptian pyramids and Stonehenge? Maybe the megalith tomb served only as a demonstration of strength and a symbol of solidarity created by a certain group of people. Megaliths are the greatest mystery connected with the peoples of the Funnel Beaker culture, named after the shape of the pots crafted by them. But they aren't the only mystery. Those who were part of the Funnel Beaker culture left behind clay pots, one containing the oldest remaining image of a cart. Tools, fragmentary remnants of their homes, those are the elements enabling us to picture the first people who began leading a settled life. The people who cultivated various grains, raised animals, fished, hunted and, most importantly, ploughed their land, used a coulter hauled by oxen. These are the people who used four-wheeled carts as a means of transportation Although, until recently, this kind of cart was believed to have been invented in Asia some centuries earlier. The people, who mined flint on an almost industrial scale and traded it as far as a few hundred kilometres away. Furthermore, they possessed an artistic passion which resulted in producing ornaments. They also improved the art of crafting stone battle axes proving that they were not only farmers, but could also fight and defend themselves. They skillfully formed and adorned clay pottery, yarned, weaved and manufactured clothing. They were familiar with astronomy. They had their own belief system and spirituality. Megaliths, the 5,500 year old story. What are the origins of the Funnel Beaker culture? This is the first culture in the areas of present-day Poland to have left its permanent imprint on nature, not only leading a symbiotic relationship with it, but successfully attempting to harness and control it. That group of people, who we as archaeologists call the Funnel Beaker people, with their name deriving from their most distinctive ceramic object they produced, a beaker with a funnel-shaped top, was the first agricultural community to appear in Central Europe. They didn't come from elsewhere, for they came into existence here. This cultural unit emerged in the belt of the European Plain Great Valleys in the areas of present-day Kujawa, Greater Poland and probably in the regions to the northwest. This took place about 4,000 years BCE. They inhabited all of Poland's territory, every region. From the Baltic Sea to the foothills, we discover their remnants, settlements and burial grounds. They were a relatively large group of people that very skillfully used all natural resources. They were able to cultivate both light, sandy soil of little efficiency and rich ones, such as the sub-Krakowian loess. 
although their settled lifestyle is certain, it seems that settlements didn't tend to remain immobile. Instead, these settlements moved around within one region. Archaeological research indicates that the Funnel Beaker people lived in relatively small multi-family settlements, usually consisting of a few, sometimes more families, living in a particular area. Construction work used timber. The house's supporting structure was based on poles stuck into the ground, providing a foundation for the roof, whereas the walls were built from rather light materials, such as various types of wattle, with clay quite often used for external insulation. The houses built by the Funnel Beaker people were relatively easy to move, which might have contributed to the demographic success accompanied by a great territorial expansion. Once settlement patterns had stabilised and the population grew, a new interesting phenomenon emerged. Previously unknown in this part of Europe, namely the construction of huge megalithic structures employing the use of large boulders, whose name derived from the Greek language. In all likelihood, the first farmers began cultivating small patches of land. This was supposed to provide them with food reserves and substantially supplement the food they hunted, fished and gathered. For hundreds of years they improved cultivation methods and expanded the numbers of cereal crops and plants they grew. Thanks to the analysis of botanical macro remains found in the settlements and their surroundings, in peat and other organic matter, we are able to precisely determine which plants were used. They constitute at least several dozen quite varied species, used both for medical and consumption purposes, as well as animal fodder. They knew at least four, maybe five types of wheat which they grew, and two types of barley and oats. Rye was usually considered a weed, those were the economic foundations of those people. There were edible plants and those used industrially, such as flax or hemp, which were used in the production of different fibres and fabrics, as they were already known at that time. There were also medicinal plants and those used for magic, like poppy and elderberry. It seems fairly certain today that poppy was a special plant known and cultivated by the peoples of the funnel beaker culture. There are theories linking their dynamic expansion with the acquaintance with this particular plant. There's even a unique vessel connected with the poppy, the so-called cruet with a ruff, which resembles the shape of a poppy head. Some argue that those vessels were used for the preparation of substances related to poppy processing. Interestingly, such cruets are often found among the scarce burial assemblages in the graves under the mounds, i.e. inside the tombs. The funnel beaker farmers also developed animal breeding. They mainly raised cattle, at least two different breeds, the so-called large cattle descended from aurochs, as well as smaller short-horned cattle. Obviously, even the then larger cattle were smaller than the cows we know today. Another very popular species among farm animals were pigs, followed by sheep and goat. As their skeletons are very similar, archaeologists sometimes find it impossible to distinguish one from the other, hence the phrase sheep and goat. So there are three groups of farm animals. Cattle always come first, pigs second, and sheep and goat come third. In addition to these domesticated animals, there's the dog, known to humans as a hunting companion for thousands of years, since the Paleolithic. Like earlier human communities, the funnel beaker peoples hunted forest animals, such as deer or wild boars. However, hunting was of secondary importance as they were predominantly breeders. As time went by, 
the farming land kept expanding due to the introduction of the coulter hauled by oxen. This was a revolutionary moment, a turning point for the agriculture of that era. The Funnel Beaker peoples were the first, at least in this area, to learn to harness a beast of burden. As mentioned earlier, they were breeders, so they also bred cattle. There's evidence that some of the bulls were intentionally castrated in order to obtain oxen, which could be used for work. There are a few places in Poland where intact remnants of ploughing have been found. Obviously, these are places located exclusively under the two mounds, where the soil hasn't been moved in any way for five and a half thousand years. Research carried out in many regions of Poland suggests that the agricultural intensity in the funnel beaker period wasn't achieved in the same places until a few thousand years later. Farming, although crucial to the existence of the funnel beaker people, left hardly any lasting traces behind. There is, however, something truly spectacular and unique that has remained, the oldest surficial relics, the megaliths. Those best preserved are located in Wieczechowice and Sarnovo in the Kujawia, hence the name Kujawian tombs. They are the greatest mystery of that era and the people shaping it. When were they built? Most probably some time after settling down. Absolute dating for tombs is still very rare. Unfortunately, archaeological research on most of them was carried out before the development of radiocarbon dating. Professor Konrad Jezdziewski, who in the 1930s discovered groups of Kujawian tombs in Fietzschehovice and Abauki, developed his own rare research method. He set the time frame for the construction of the tombs for approximately 3700 to 3300 BCE. In Kujawia, there are several tombs dated by means of the radiocarbon method. My research in Guy has recently led to dating two burials using the bones of the humans concerned. This suggests that the megaliths were usually built around 3500 BCE. The megaliths had the shape of an elongated triangle. They reached up to 15 metres in width and 150 metres in length. It's still unknown how the building materials were obtained especially the boulders weighing as much as a few tons, which often had to be transported from several kilometres away. These stones had to be found somewhere, for they weren't just lying around. Sometimes they had to be dug out of the ground from a metre or two beneath the surface and later transported to the building site. Just gathering the constructional materials must have lasted months. Oxen enabled transporting the boulders from further locations. This has been proved by the discovery of something like ruts beneath the mound covering some tombs. These marks may not have been made by carts, which at that time did exist, but were too lightly built to have carried boulders whose weight amounted to a few tons. However, we can imagine those heavy loads being hauled to the burial grounds on some kind of sleighs or other equipment used for dragging heavy objects. It was the boulders placed right next to each other that gave the tombs the triangular framing. They were carefully selected and arranged with the smoother, visible surface facing outside. An effort was made to put the highest boulders in the frontal, wider part of the tomb, which usually faced east and the boulder height gradually lowered towards the western, narrower end. If possible, 
the higher stones were dug into the ground to equalize their height, while the lower ones were placed on small stone bases. When Professor Konrad Vyazhevsky reconstructed the first tomb in Vyachehovice in the 1930s, he quite carefully counted its elements. How many tons of stone, soil and various other building materials had to be gathered? Surely this was a job for a large group of people. A question arises, how were 400 or 600 boulders, of which the tomb consisted, collected if each weighed several tons? So-called funerary temples were often played inside the tombs. A little gap between the tomb's frontal boulders served as an entrance to the funerary temple one had to pass before moving on towards the western part, where the grave of the most important buried person, always male, was located. Funerary temples were located inside the frontal part of the tomb. They are usually square, all built out of wood, but using different structural solutions. They were either post, log or post and plank constructions. Usually there was a vertical pole placed within, providing a foundation for the roof. The earthen floors were made very carefully, with the clay sometimes being burned. Hardly anything has remained from the interiors of these temples, except the construction itself and the pit inside, containing charcoal particles. We can speculate that the funerary temples serve for carrying out ceremonies during burials and later for making sacrifices in the name of those buried. The tombs were used for a very long time. Here I have another example from my own research. In Gai, I discovered a relic of a cult building located in the frontal part of the tomb. A similar one was discovered in the 1950s by Professor Hamielewski. The radiocarbon dating of this building's burnt wooden relics indicates its long-term usage and reconstructions. The youngest reconstruction was carried out at least 200 to 300 years after the burials beneath the mound. That also gives the perspective of the time this society functioned and took care of these tombs. It can be assumed that these burial grounds, consisting of a few, sometimes a dozen megalithic formations, served as sacral religious centres for the whole settlement micro-region. The means and effort put into building the megaliths has inspired admiration for centuries and still does. According to legends, which for thousands of years helped people explain the inexplicable, these stone and soil formations were built by giants as their final resting place. As in every legend, here too is a grain of truth. In reality, these enormous buildings, named the Polish Pyramids, were burial grounds, not, however, for giants, but for ordinary people, although they weren't that ordinary after all. What's fascinating is that these huge constructions were actually built for one person. Of course, we don't know who that person exactly was, but we can assume it was an outstanding individual, a leader of that society, some kind of tribal chief or a priest. The people buried in such tombs were in all certainty male, generally around the ages of 40 to 50, which for Neolith standards was really old. 
From an archaeological stand, these mature men were equipped quite poorly for their journey into the afterlife. Their so-called prestigious items usually consisted of a battle axe, a flint dagger or a copper dagger. The main grave was always built on the tomb's symmetry axis, located in the frontal, wider eastern part. The deceased's body was placed according to the tomb's structure, with his legs towards the east and head towards the west. The body was frequently surrounded with stones, lying on a stone set, and sometimes even the burial pit was covered with stone, so, in one way or another, stone was always included. It's actually hard to imagine any grave from the funnel beaker culture without a stone element. Therefore, we can assume that it was a necessary attribute for a burial. We can also speculate that it was part of their whole religious concept due to its, adequate till this day, symbolic meanings. Stone is associated with immortality and indestructibility, and those were most probably the qualities wished for for one's afterlife. According to archaeologists, the burial nature of the megalithic constructions wasn't their only intended use. Who knows if other purposes weren't far more important to the builders? Archaeologists assume that one of these purposes could have been sending a signal to other communities in order to prove their strength and solidarity. Every political authority leaves behind itself some building. These buildings, especially tombs, are enormous and serve as a symbol representing the solidarity of the community that built them. That community was ideologically cemented and these huge megalithic tombs, serving as a tribute to the leaders, are proof. If someone saw huge tombs surrounding a village on the horizon, it meant that the village consisted of many men and, therefore, can be considered a powerful military formation that has to be respected. Also, there's the aspect of magic related to such constructions that could as well pose as a threat to any outsiders. There are also other theories. The research conducted in North Germany proved that these kinds of constructions were built along trade routes. Therefore, I believe that only when we possess the knowledge regarding the exact amount of these constructions, combined with settlement analyses, will we be able to say what purpose, except the burial one, they served. I don't think megalithic tombs had to serve one specific purpose. I think their role can be interpreted on many different levels. Hundreds if not thousands of megalithic tombs located in the areas of today's Poland were irrevocably damaged, especially during the 19th and 20th centuries. Therefore, it is encouraging that recently, thanks to the newest technologies and aerial laser scanning, a dozen new clearly visible megaliths have been discovered in the forests east of Góry, a village bordering with the Vilchin and Sleshin municipalities in the Konin district. It is the best preserved burial ground of this type in Greater Poland, and most probably the final one this big to be found in Poland. In the Kleczew, Vilcin and Sleszyn municipalities, there are around 600 areas that used to be inhabited by the Funnel Beaker peoples. The burial ground in Góry is probably one of the many that used to exist in Poland. In the 19th century, Edward Raczynski mentioned in his Memoirs of Wielkopolska to have seen 150 tombs in the area of Kleczew. Yet, unfortunately, we don't know where exactly this was. 
Only a few have remained till our days. Therefore, the discovery in Guri, where 14 tombs up to one and a half meters tall were found, makes it even more precious. As our field surveys indicated, in some places the stones surrounding the tombs have remained intact. Hence purporting the idea to add the burial ground to the heritage register and protect it for future generations and archaeologists will possibly have more efficient research methods and means at their disposal. For now, let's just let it wait for better times. We haven't discovered the settlement connected to the burial grounds, as it is in a woodland area and everything in the range of a few hundred metres around the burial grounds is densely overgrown. However, in the fields surrounding the Guri woodlands there are many posts, not only settlements but also burial grounds. A similar burial ground, unfortunately completely destroyed, is located in Ostis Wovo, a kilometre from the one in Gure. A settlement in Shishinek that was dug by archaeologists over a decade ago also contains a burial ground. However, not one meant for extraordinary individuals but ordinary folk and is located around one and a half kilometres away. In the area around that forest, there are a few dozen traces left after settlements, proving that it was an intensively inhabited territory throughout many generations. That's why there are so many burial grounds in that area. One theory claims that one tomb equals one generation. It's worth noting that some time ago, in the area next to the megaliths, a true archaeological treasure was found. Until recently, it was the biggest discovery of this kind in Poland. Now, it can be seen in the District Museum in Konin. I wouldn't exactly call it a treasure, for it simply was a set of household ceramics that ended up in that pit. Because these items were burnt to a large extent, I came up with a theory that there was a sort of cabinet partly placed in the pit holding all of these ceramics, stacked on shelves one on top of another with a quern stone between them. All this burned and collapsed to the bottom of the pit, where we discovered somewhere around three and a half thousand broken pieces that I glued together like puzzles in the course of six months, recreating 36 pots. Another gathering of megaliths that survived until present times on the map of today's Poland, indicating that the Funnel Beaker peoples inhabited great areas of their own contemporary world, is located in the region of West Pomerania. Those most impressive and attention-grabbing can be found in Dolitsa, Pomietów and Kremsova. They are as recognisable on the megalithic map of Poland as those from Wieczechowice and Sarnowo. We're in Dolice, a place of amazing prehistoric significance. There are at least a dozen megalithic tombs located here that, in archaeological terminology, are called the Kujawian megaliths. This place's history is so absolutely amazing. This site had been discovered and registered before the Second World War due to Ernst Sprockhoff's megalith tomb stock-taking initiative in the West Pomeranian region. It was he who noted the presence of this site, though suggesting that it was largely destroyed. He described it as a 50-metre-long, trapezoid-shaped structure. In 2017, field research was carried out, our main objective being to move the stones surrounding the tomb so that we could find out its actual length, shape and preservation status. 
długość, jaki jest jego kształt, jaki jest stan zachowania. The first stage consisted of the so-called non-invasive geomagnetic research that confirmed the presence of the tomb's stone surrounding that was covered with soil. Afterwards, we managed to uncover the whole stone surrounding and found out that it's much larger than we, according to Sprockhoff's research, originally assumed. We revealed that the stone surrounding is 70 meters long and has preserved quite well. We were also able to gather ceramic material consisting of flint tools and pieces of broken pots identified with the Funnel Beaker peoples who had built the Kujawian megalithic tombs. We aren't sure, and I don't believe we'll ever be, how many megalithic tombs there were in this region. Archival sources state that there were over 100 tombs in the Pszelewice area. And some archaeologists claim that in the Pszelewice Stargard lowlands there were over 200, yet, in my opinion, there were far more. While talking about the megalithic structures in the Pomeranian area, it's impossible not to mention Borkovo in the Swavno district, home to the only chambered passage tomb in Poland. It was built out of 12 stone blocks covered with four enormous boulders. Travelling further down the east of Pomerania, we find our way to the Wupava River. Thanks to archaeologists and many passionate individuals, we can admire the megalithic tombs of the Funnel Beaker culture, although not as big and long as the ones found in Dolitsa or Kuyava, but equally well preserved. It's also important to add that the Funnel Beaker people survived much longer in the areas of Pomerania than in the areas of today's Kuyava or Greater Poland. Poland's largest conjuries of megalithic tombs have preserved till this day, which consists of at least several dozen of them, are located in the area of Wupava's basin. Probably around 40 of them have remained intact, due to the fact that in the area there aren't many cities, only small villages. The tombs situated deep within the forests haven't suffered any damage towards the end of the 19th and the beginning of the 20th century. More so, they haven't been damaged by the destructive nature of archaeological research. We try to preserve the tombs by using non-invasive research methods, probing them without damaging them. Take, for instance, a surgeon who dissects a body during an autopsy and compare it to an ultrasonography that gives the same result without actually damaging the body. The same method applies to our research in the Wupava area. The greatest conjuries of tombs aren't, however, considered to be as impressive as the ones in Greater Poland or Kujawa, due to their maximum length of 50 meters. The tombs and burial grounds presented above undoubtedly have many dimensions, including the spiritual one. Respect for the dead alone makes these places sacred. While discussing megaliths as burial places, a question naturally arises concerning the appearance of the people representing the Funnel Beaker culture, who built the megaliths and created a perfectly functioning society several thousand years before the emergence of the civilizations we know so well. Unfortunately, the condition of the human remains obtained from the tombs isn't sufficiently good to allow the recreation of the male representative's image, the only skeleton from that period preserved well enough to enable scientists the facial reconstruction is a female skeleton from the early stage of the Funnel Beaker culture, found in the so-called flat grave in Oswanki, in the Kujawian Pomeranian Voivodeship. 
Here we have a quite well-preserved skeleton belonging to a female representing the funnel beaker culture. Unlike the others from that period, this skeleton is mostly complete and intact. The skull, larger parts of the torso, the upper limbs, the almost crucial for determining the sex, pelvic bones and the lower limbs. Taking into consideration the dental abrasion, the closure of the cranial sutures, the general condition of the skeleton, the lack of visible muscle insertions, the lack of pathological, degenerative changes of the spine, we can determine that the woman was between 30 and 40 years old and was 146 centimetres tall. The front teeth were strongly worn down, which could have been the result of chewing and employing them extensively as tools, a practice nowadays common among the Inuit. The remaining pelvic bones are very fragile and possess a feature characteristic of women, a wide, greater sciatic notch. So, there is no need for genetic tests, as the morphology of the skeleton itself proves beyond doubt that the subject was female. In order to reconstruct the face of a woman who was one of the first farmers inhabiting the area of present-day Poland almost 6,000 years ago, we are carefully transporting the skull painstakingly assembled by Dr. Wiesław Lorkiewicz to the Department of Forensic Medicine at the Poznan Medical University. Before that, however, it has to be scanned at the Poznan University of Technology. As the first stage, scanning is carried out by means of an optical scanner, which uses structured light. This process involves projecting a pattern of light onto the subject, which is captured by cameras and converted into the form of a point cloud. In the next stages, that point cloud, captured from different angles, is connected into one consistent three-dimensional model. That obtained model is a full three-dimensional surface model, in this case, of a skull. We then conduct comparative measurements between the model and the skull in order to verify the quality of the obtained model. After applying the images captured at the beginning of the process, we then can conduct an optical comparison to find out if these objects are congruent and to confirm the quality of the obtained model so that no geometric deformations occur during the actual reconstruction. In the next stage, we apply special markers that symbolize the soft tissue depth in distinctive areas of the skull. This procedure later enables recreating specific facial muscles and skin layers. Once finished with the 3D scanning process, further work on recreating the image of the funnel beaker woman was carried out by Dr. Dorota Lorkiewicz Muszynska. The skull is the part of the skeleton which provides us with comprehensive information about the deceased, particularly the facial area which constitutes the skeletal surface for soft tissues, on the basis of which we can construct the person's face. We must, however, remember that this is only an approximation of the appearance. Considering the fact that the skeletal surface is strongly linked to soft tissues in many places, the similarity is quite high and ranges between 60 to 90 percent.
Commonly, this method is often used in investigative procedures. That's why this method is so commonly used with regard to archaeological research materials connected with prehistoric populations in order to obtain a visual image of their representatives. That too was the objective of this case, to reconstruct the image of a female at the age of approximately 35. The final stage is the colorization of the head reconstructed on the basis of the preserved skull. Thanks to scientists, we are able to witness a truly spectacular event. For the first time in Poland, we can acquaint ourselves with the 6,000-year-old face of a female representative of one of the oldest cultures inhabiting the area of present-day Poland. Individual morphological features of the skull, such as the nasal bones, the mandible jaw structure, the profiling of the alveolar process bone, the arrangement of the teeth, the occlusion type, the profiling of the zygomatic bones, all constitute the subject's presumed appearance. These features are directly connected to the soft tissue. However, we also conduct a series of additional examinations, measurements and indicator calculations that allow us to speculate the subject's pigmentation of hair and eyes. In this case, according to the conducted research, we managed to determine that the subject had light hair and iris pigmentation, hence the blue eyes. Working with such dated material is intriguing. Being able to reach back in history thanks to this physical, real object is quite actually amazing. A link is made between us and the person whose face we reconstruct and in some ways we're also able to recreate those ancient times she lived in. There's a non-verbal connection between us. Thanks to the recreated image, we're able to look into the eyes of a person from these distant times to see how they looked, whereas archaeological research allows us to understand and imagine how these people lived. The funnel beak of people inhabiting the area of today's Poland left behind one more thing as phenomenal as the megalithic tombs. It's the oldest image of a cart, preserved till this day, dating as far back as 5,500 years ago. This unique discovery was made by Professor Janusz Kruk from the Polish Academy of Sciences. The vase-shaped pot is one of the most, if not the most, significant discoveries made. What importance does it have? First of all, there's a visual narrative consisting of a few elements engraved on a large part of the pot. You could call it something in a sort of a letter from the past. The author managed to pass on to us information regarding the reality of his times. The narrative engraved on the pot consists of an image of a conifer tree, which may be fields intersected by roads and ditches, possibly an image of water, and most importantly a representation of a cart repeated four times, five in total. The four-wheeled vehicle is hauled by two animals, most probably oxen. The wheels are turned on the sides, commonly referred to as a quad in descriptive geometry. There's another circular-shaped object within the cart's frame, interpreted by some as an image representing the sun, and by others as seen from above as a ceramic object carried by the cart. This image proves that both four-wheel traction and harnesses, most probably for oxen, were used. Arguably, these lands had to be cleared. 
There's another crucial aspect of this discovery, namely the dating of this image. It was dated by a radiocarbon method in the Groningen, Netherlands laboratories to 3520 BC. The BP, before present date, is established to be 4725 plus over 50 years, as the commencement date of the BP age scale is 1950. So far, it's undoubtedly the oldest proof for the usage of four-wheel traction. Unquestionably, it's some kind of a record, and what's more, it's a kind of impression, and therefore, a form of art, it's describing the reality known to the author. A message has been passed on to us, as if we're receiving a letter from the past. In this respect, such a discovery is of unique significance. It not only proves that those people used wheels as a method of transportation, but what may seem as a bit of an exaggeration, could build vehicles which, from a technical perspective, resemble contemporary four-wheeled vehicles, almost cars. There's the frame, steering system and four wheels, presumably suspended on some sort of axle, though we can only speculate as the picture isn't so detailed. Ergo, a lot has been said from a technical perspective, which also indicates the, one could say, technological advancement of these people. To sum up Professor Cook's statement, we have to emphasize the fact that the unique discovery of the Brunatica pot indicates the use of wheel transportation in the area of today's Poland from more than 5,000 years ago. Undoubtedly, any proof of using four-wheeled carts and harnessing has a huge significance for the research regarding the civilizations inhabiting this part of the world. The funnel beaker culture is part of the Stone Age. How long did cutting down one tree last with the use of a primitive stone axe? The partly wooden and stone structure couldn't be durable and the Neolithic lumberjack couldn't apply all of his strength so that he wouldn't damage the precious tool. That's why cutting down even a small tree had to be a process lasting many hours. And how many trees had to be cut down in order to obtain the raw material necessary to build a house. This is not to mention the almost surreal task of clearing a whole forest to create space for the growing crops or cutting down a huge tree in order to build a dugout, canoe. Let's leave the speculations regarding the amount of physical effort put into these tasks to the viewers. The labour would hardly be possible without the discovery of flint. The question who was first to notice that cracked, fractured flint not only enables starting a fire, but also has extremely sharp and firm edges making it possible to cut and chop, will forever remain unanswered. Processed pieces of flint are found within every discovered settlement. Those located far away from its occurrence acquired it by trading. The cultivation lands were tightly surrounded by forests which had to be cleared. The funnel beaker peoples used for that purpose flint and stone tools in the form of various axes. 
Manufacturing large flint axes required the development of another skill, namely mining. The Funnelbeaker peoples found high-quality deposits of striped flint in the area of today's Kremionki, located near Ostrovich Fintokshiski. The mines are world-class monuments. The range of exploitation is 78.5 hectares. The length measures almost 4.5 kilometers. And the width in some areas reaches up to 200 meters. This is the largest flint extraction point in the world, discovered by archaeologists. The beginning period of exploiting flint in these mines is established to be within the 4th millennium BC, the Funnel Beaker period, evolving throughout the next 1,000 years or more to the beginning of the Bronze Age. The raw material gathered was striped flint, which in those times, or probably even earlier, raised the people's interest to such an extent they decided to obtain it from considerable depths. It was mostly used to produce cutting and chopping tools, especially axe and chisel blades. Once mined from the underground, it was processed directly in the workshops located near the pits. The final process, polishing, took place in the settlements located within the range of a few or a dozen kilometers away from the mines. The main product, made from striped flint, were axes, usually made by dividing a large flint concretion into smaller, parallel pieces, called by archaeologists slices, which allowed creating a four-edged shape, typical for the funnel beaker culture. Były siekierami o czterech ścianach, czterech bokach pod kątem prostym się zbiegających. The flint made axes contributed to the advancement of civilization to a large extent. Thanks to them, people could cultivate new areas and build houses with the use of timber. Wood processing developed on a large scale, so it's clear it was an important element for the advancement of that civilization. Axes themselves definitely represented some kind of material opulence that could be traded, bought, or sold, as we would say nowadays, and they definitely were of high value and meaning to the Funnel Beaker peoples. The axes produced here were exported to considerable distances, between 600 to 660 kilometers. So within the whole area of today's Poland and the parts of bordering countries, Discoveries were made both in northeast Germany and regions belonging to the Czech Republic and Slovakia, as well as individual, singular findings in the areas of West Ukraine. Flint was most probably transported through river routes, which is possible how it got to Kuyave. Besides that, as we know, the funnel beaker period is when four-wheeled carts were invented, so it's possible that overland trails were already used. In the Neolithic period, not only the means of transportation, ploughing and woodcutting were improved. All of these were activities requiring strength, resourcefulness and determination, producing everyday objects, improving the quality of life and such as cutting tools like knives and sickles, ceramics, ornaments, clothes or weapons in the form of bows, all required manual skills, patience and knowledge. This group is one big phenomenon. We aren't quite sure what went on among these people, yet we know, however, that they stand out compared to others. 
crafting was a very important aspect of their lives. Generally speaking, in order to survive, a human being needed food, a place to sleep, and some sort of protection from the changing weather. Any other activity or skill development being a waste of time with regard to basic existence. However, developing spiritual and material cultures, improving the quality of life, were impacted by any other additional activity, such as scrupulous ceramic, textile or copperwork, appropriate hunting techniques, creating ornaments out of seashells and any other available materials. All of these activities meant dedicating time in return, however, for mental development and creativity. Enhancing skills that theoretically weren't necessary on a practical level created a new, better lifestyle. These people weren't primitive, as is commonly believed, for they were actually similar to us in some ways. They were creative and imaginative, pursuing ideas that, in theory, were unachievable, yet proved them to be possible. Effort and willingness were definitely strong qualities of the Funnel Beaker peoples. The funnel-shaped pots, which provided the name for the whole culture, were made out of clay with additives, according to two different methods. The first method consisted of carving a hole in a lump of clay and shaping the pot by lifting the clay around the hole. The second method was based on rolling a long piece of clay into a spiral, allowing it to evenly distribute the pot's edges. Shaping the pot was an incredibly hard task. The edges had to be both even and smooth, otherwise it could easily damage. In order to ensure their sustainability, the pots needed to be appropriately burned. This had to be done by a trial and error method. However, the discovered artefacts, once indispensable everyday objects, proved that over 5,000 years ago, functional and durable clay pots were made in the area of today's Poland. The best example being the ones presented earlier, exhibited in the museum in Konin. The funnel beakers themselves, theoretically, didn't have to funnel shape necks. However, it was a way of presenting skill and individuality by the prehistoric man. These people were the first to introduce such large pots meant for containing resources in the form of food in the area of today's Poland. This indicates their resourcefulness, planning one step ahead in order to preserve the grain for next year and secure it against rodents. In addition, there's the cult aspect of the ram figures created by the Funnel Beaker people. They were carefully made with tremendous detail, accurately presenting the animal's anatomic features, even recreating its fur by imprinting pieces of rope. The first metalware appearing in that period proves that it was a well-developed culture. Of course, the copper wasn't extracted from our territories because today's sources of copper were unknown during the Neolithic period. It was imported from the areas of Transylvania or the Eastern Alps. That's also where it was mined and processed. Among the funnel beaker peoples, the most popular copper products were rather small, flat axes and ornaments. The best example of the latter is another spectacular discovery, namely the so-called Bitin oxen found near Shamatui. It's a unique discovery for all of Europe. There's further proof of using harnesses in these areas. There are two figurines of oxen originally connected to each other by some sort of copper construction, probably representing the yoke they were harnessed to. 
the oxen have holes carved in their sides, so presumably they hauled something, but unfortunately this element has not been preserved. But their presence alone with the mentioned copper axes indicates that the Funnel Beaker people were familiar with such objects. More so were they willing to obtain these valuable items imported from far away, presumably the Eastern Alps. In order to get hold of these goods, which could be compared to today's value of gold or precious stones, they too had to offer something of worth for the trade. We can only assume it was Baltic amber or some kind of raw materials. The funnel beaker people could also obtain food from the water. They produced hooks, lines and nets, which they used in order to fish in the rich waters of nearby reservoirs, lakes, backwaters and rivers. The fish constituted protein and fat supplements essential to their health, more so than the nutrients provided by the meat from farmed pigs. The previously mentioned aspects regarding agriculture and timber are but small examples of the effort necessary to make in order to protect themselves from cold weather and hunger, thus providing themselves with relative safety. Despite that, they managed to create a community able to predict, plan, construct and, most importantly, learn and find new ways to make their life easier. Among other things, they discovered a method of how not to overwork their muscles. They used wheeled transport, animal traction and introduced coulters. Ploughing fields with oxen, although it may nowadays seem unimaginably hard, was a discovery that not only made the whole process earlier, but also speeded it up and significantly increased the crops, so improving food security for the whole community. The Funnel Beaker peoples undoubtedly fully popularised agriculture in the areas of Central Europe. Without their input, this process would be far more problematic. Discoveries related to the Funnel Beaker period are so frequent that only the couple of thousand younger Lusatian culture, the builders of Biskupin, can compete in the amount of prehistoric findings. We know, for certain, that their highly developed farming skills and their familiarity with nature allowing them to skillfully use all of the natural resources resulted in a demographic explosion. For the next 1,000 years, these peoples created the community inhabiting and exploiting, it's not meant to be negative, the areas of Central Europe. The prehistory of Poland is in all certainty important as it's a cultural footprint left on the map of Europe. However, it's worth asking ourselves one question. Shouldn't the locations of the megalithic tombs become places widely known and recognisable, as the ones in Wietzschehovice and Sarnovo in the Kujawian Pomeranian Voivodship? A well-designed and promoted message about the Polish megaliths could enter the European route of megalithic culture and promote our distant history. Allowing the whole country and world to find out about our unique megalithic tombs, bearing in mind who, or in other words, what culture built them. <laughs>